AEW Wrestle Dream was undoubtedly a great pay-per-view and it potentially featured the retirement of Brian Danielson. But also, AEW, we need to have a serious discussion about your attitude towards women's wrestling. Welcome to Allison Analysis. I'm Ben Allison and I've analyzed last night's AEW Wrestle Dream pay-per-view and here are my five key findings. In at number five, the Swerve Strickland segment didn't need to be on the pay-per-view. Now, don't get me wrong, it was a great segment, and Swift's performance in it was exceptional. But by putting it on a pay-per-view, by putting it in such a big spot, you made fans think that Bobby Lashley was going to debut, and that meant that coming out of this segment, you could just hear the unhappiness in the arena. Everybody felt let down because everybody expected it. Whereas if it was just on a normal episode of AEW Dynamite, sure, some people might have speculated, oh, maybe Bobby Lashley will show up, but it wouldn't have been the expectation, and then people's attitude towards this segment would have been a lot different. Because what sucks about this the most is that the segment was actually great. Everyone involved, especially Swerve, were just killed it in this segment. They really, really did. I was on the edge of my seat. I genuinely thought Swerve might just turn on Nana, but he didn't. It was done exceptionally well. We're at a point where there could genuinely be an argument that Swerve Strickland is the best full package in AEW. His promos are some of the best in the business, his acting is off the charts incredible, and his in-ring work, well that speaks for itself. In at number 4, Konosuke Takesta deserved this international championship run. Firstly, the triple threat last night was just uh, unbelievable. I didn't even have any words for it, that's how good it was. Ricochet, Osprey, Takesta, they all killed it, and the Carl Fletcher turn was done very well as well. It told a story, but also featured some of the most innovative stuff I've seen in a long time. This is truly up there with the all-time triple threat matches. I mean, when it comes to innovation, you genuinely could argue this is the best ever. But what I want to focus on here is how much Takesta deserves this. I feel like the guy goes under the radar far too often in AEW, because in ring, and I genuinely mean this, I'm not exaggerating, I think there is an argument which could be made that he is the best worker in the entire company. For me, it's between him and Osprey. And we've seen that a few times in AEW, we have, but during his summer run in New Japan Pro Wrestling's G1 Climax Tournament, he proved it more than ever. Seriously, if you guys have New Japan World, and that's, this isn't an advert for that, but if you do have it, go and watch his run there, because he just had banger every day for an entire month. I still do feel like this international championship isn't living up to its name because the idea behind it, and this was said by Tony Khan himself, that it was going to be defended around the world in different promotions, yet so far the only champion to properly do that to my knowledge is MJF, who is meant to be the heel American champion. I mean, hopefully Takesta can change that, and I mean, seriously, I could well see it, but I also thought Osprey would be the one to change it too. In at number 3, the MJF Adam Cole storyline is going to be a nightmare to write. I'm so happy that Adam Cole is finally back, I've missed him so much. And of course, MJF hasn't been gone for nearly as long, but I've missed him as well. But the fact they are now continuing this feud with Adam Cole as the babyface and MJF as the heel, it's going to be an absolute headache. Usually I have an idea on how to buck everything, but in this situation, even I have no clue. I still think it was a massively wrong decision to turn MJF heel before Cole returned. Surely you could have just had him as a babyface for a few more months. And maybe it's because they thought that Adam Cole would be so over when he comes back. But you could have added that to the story. MJF could have been the face, Cole returns, everyone roots for Cole, and then MJF turns heel because he feels like fans have betrayed him. That would have made a thousand times more sense than his actual heel turn. But now you are stuck in a storyline where either you're going to have to turn the entire Undisputed Kingdom face, ignore the fact that it ever happened, or have Cole leave them ASAP. And all of those options are insanely stupid. But again, there isn't a good solution. They booked themselves in a corner here. I really hope they stun me on this and they somehow deliver a great storyline. I mean, maybe they have an idea that I haven't thought of, and I really hope that's the case. Because this storyline, it deserves a good payoff. In at number two, AEW has inadvertently created an environment which doesn't encourage women's wrestling. I don't know what I'm more frustrated by. The fact that there was one women's match on a nine-match card pay-per-view, or the fact that only one of these so-called journalists in the press conference had a question for AEW's world women's champion, Mariah May. 
But here's the thing, if you buck the women's division like you don't care about it, you give them one segment or one match a week, then of course people are going to care less. And this is something similar to what my friend Ashley Daniel said last night on our Instagram post, and honestly, she hit the nail on the head with it. If you said a president about not caring about women's wrestling, then slowly journalists and fans will care less too. And also, like Ashley says, WWE are not innocent in this at all. They're the exact same pretty much right now. NXT is killing it, but the main roster, not so much. I always say it, but it's true. Professional wrestling is like a stock market. The more time you put into a competitor, the higher the chances you get a return with them. And idiots will say that there's no draws in that division. Firstly, statistically, that's a complete lie. mercedes Monet is either their second or first highest draw, depending on what numbers you're looking at. But secondly, MJF, Darby Allen, Jack Perry, none of those were draws when the company started. But all three of them, right, individually have had more time than anybody on that women's roster in terms of on-screen time. And now look, they're all draws. It's simply not good enough. That is the bottom line. In WWE, they've given women less in ring time in the last year than they have done since, I think, 2016. Like, come on, guys, we need to talk about that. And in AEW, well, it's always been abysmal, but it's not getting any better. I thought it would with Monet coming in, but it's not. As wrestling media, we need to start asking questions of both Tony Khan and Paul Levesque Triple H when it comes to this. In at number one, is Brian Danielson's career over? The ending to last night's pay-per-view might just be the most controversial ending in AEW pay-per-view history. Well, excluding the exploding ring spot in 2020. Brian Danielson potentially retired last night by basically being murdered in his home state. And a lot of people are absolutely hating this. But here's the thing, right? How you go out in professional wrestling should ultimately be up to you. And this is clearly what Danielson wanted. It's going to get John Moxley and the BCC absolutely nuclear heat. So honestly, I really don't have an issue with it. What I do have a little bit of an issue with is I don't think the storyline was at a point to do this yet. I feel like it felt like this was early into the storyline. I think you could have dragged it out a bit longer. But hey, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because Brian Danielson's neck, it's clearly messed up. Maybe they had to rush in. In fact, they probably did. But now the question is, is Brian Danielson's career done or is he just going to go part time? The answer to that question, I think, is dependent on his next surgery. I really do, because it's going to be such a tough surgery to recover from. It is possible, but it's going to be hard, and I think that's what he's decided. I think he's decided that if he can come back, then he'll come back part-time, but if he can't come back, then he's happy where he's left it. And at least this time, he's ended it on his own terms. Danielson's run in AEW has been truly incredible, and it's just another chapter in his absolutely insanely good career legendary career, dare I say. And if anybody in that company deserves to be a four times champion, it is John Moxley. The dude has been the glue of the promotion. He's been there almost since day one. And every time, you know, something come down or something, he's picked up the bricks and he's put it back together himself. So I have no issue with him winning the belt once again. But for today, more importantly, thank you, Brian. Hopefully this isn't the end. But if it is, I mean, what a way to go out and what a career. Anyway, that's all the analysis for AEW Wrestle Dream. If you did enjoy, please like and subscribe, and I will see you guys in the next video. Pa pa pa, peace.